In the last video, we saw how to define a linear regression model and how to define a loss function that tells us how well a particular linear regression model is doing for a particular set of data. In this video, we'll look at how to search the space of all possible models for a good one that gives us a low loss for our data. Remember that in the first lecture, we talked about the two most important spaces in machine learning, the feature space, which if we have a one-dimensional regression model, like the one we are using as an example today, the feature space is the horizontal axis in a plot like this, and the model space. And in the model space, every possible model is a point, and the model space is what we search for a well-fitting model. A loss function gives us a surface over our model space, and since we have a model space in this case with two parameters, so a two-dimensional model space with parameters w and b, we can actually we can actually plot what our loss surface looks like for the data that we showed earlier. Here the black points are points with high loss, and the lighter the points get, the lower the loss gets. We've actually plotted the logarithm of the loss just so that it the details of the loss surface show up a little better. So this is a summary of our task. Search the model space for a model that gives us low loss. In technical terms, that's an optimization problem, which we can express with an argmin operator. The argmin operator tells us that for a particular variable, which we name by putting it under the argmin, so we name the variable p, find the value p for which the function loss gives the lowest value, is minimized, and then return that value p. And the optimum, the optimal value p, we will call p hat. And in our example, p is the collection of all the numbers that define a current model. So all the weights and the bias together. Now in machine learning, quite often we won't be able to find the absolute minimum of the loss landscape. So we'll look for ways to approximate this optimization problem. And the first algorithm we'll look at is called random search. It's very simple and very straightforward to implement, but it's already surprisingly powerful. We simply start with a random point somewhere in the model space. We enter a loop. We pick another random point close to P and we'll define what that means later. And if the new point has a better loss, a lower loss than the old point, then we switch to the new point. Then the new point becomes our current best guess. We go back to the top of the loop and we pick another point close to that one and so on. If the new point doesn't have better loss, we discard it and we stick with our current one and we pick another random point. A common analogy for this process is that of the hiker in a snowstorm. Imagine you're hiking in the mountains and you're caught in a snowstorm. You can't see a thing and you'd like to go down to your hotel in the valley. Or failing that, you would at least like to get to as low a point as possible. You can't see anything, but what you can do is take a couple of steps in every direction to see in which direction the mountain goes down the quickest, and then take a step in that direction and then repeat the process. If you just keep doing that, you'll at least get lower down the mountain, and with a little bit of luck, you'll find your hotel again. This, in effect, is what random search is doing. More importantly, it illustrates how blind random search is to the larger structure of the landscape. Note that we hadn't quite precisely defined what it means to sample a point close to our current point. So we'll do that now. So let's say P here is our initial random guess. We're now going to sample a point close to P. One way of doing that is simply to look at all the points that are a fixed distance away from P. Uh, and we pick a random point out of all of these, call that P prime. And then we look at the loss for both of these points. And as we see in the background, for this particular choice, P prime actually has a worse loss, has a higher loss than the original P. So we discard it and we just stick with P and we sample another point P prime. This time we're lucky and we get a P prime with a lower loss. So now we discard P and P prime becomes our new P. And after a few steps, we get something that looks like this. We started on the left here and what you see in uh, slightly transparent steps are the guesses for next points that failed. That meant we would end up with a higher loss than the original P. And the opaque lines are the steps that were successful, the steps in the direction of a lower loss. And you can see that the structure of the trajectory is a bit random, but ultimately we do end up in a region of low loss. And here's what that looks like in the feature space. One of the reasons such a simple approach works well enough for our problem is that in this case, our problem is convex. A surface, like our loss landscape, is convex if a line drawn between any two points on the surface lies entirely above the surface, like this. Here we see two arbitrary points on the surface, 
and the line between them lies entirely above the surface. And if that's true for any two points, then we call the surface convex. And one of the implications of convexity is that any point that looks like a minimum locally, because all the nearby points are higher, must be a global minimum. It's lower than any other point on the surface. And that minimum is the optimal model. So long as we know we're moving down, we can be sure that we're moving towards the minimum. Not all lost surfaces are convex. And sometimes you have multiple minima, each the minimum in their local neighborhood, but not all of them the minimum over the whole loss surface. Here's an example of that. This is a non-convex loss surface with one global minimum, one point that is lower than any other point on the surface, and two local minima, points that in their local neighborhood are minimal, but that are higher than the global minimum. And what we see with something like random search is that it can often get stuck in local minima. Here we have a trajectory on our non-convex loss surface using random search, and we see that it makes a beeline for one of the local minima and then gets stuck there. No matter how many iterations we give it, it will never escape. This is not always a bad thing, but sometimes you do want your model to be able to escape local minima. And one very simple trick to do that is what's called simulated annealing. The simulated annealing algorithm is very similar to the random search, with two lines added here, where in random search we only move to the next model if it has a lower loss than the current model. In simulated annealing we can also move to the next model if it has a worse loss with a small probability q. And this means that with a small probability the algorithm can essentially move uphill and that allows it to escape local minima with a small probability, which is what we see here. As before, the algorithm gets stuck in one of the local minima but after a little bit of moving around, it escapes and moves to the global minimum. Of course, there's always the possibility that it will jump out of the global minimum again and move back to a local minimum, but that shouldn't worry us much, because we can always remember the best model we've observed. At this point, it's important to note that while machine learning is a lot like optimization, there are some fundamental differences. Optimization is concerned with finding the absolute minimum or maximum of a function. The lower the better, no ifs or buts. In machine learning, if we have a very expressive model class, like the regression tree from last lecture, the model that actually minimizes the loss on the training data is the one that overfits. In such cases, we're not looking to minimize the loss on the training data, since that would mean overfitting, we're looking to minimize the loss on the test data. Of course, we don't get to see the test data, so we use the training data as a stand-in and try to control against overfitting as best as we can. In the case of underpowered models, like the linear model, this distinction isn't too important, since they're very unlikely to overfit. Therefore, the model that minimizes the loss on the training data is likely the model that minimizes the loss on the test data as well. There are a few variations on random search. What we've done so far is take steps of a fixed radius. We can also sample next models randomly within that radius, which gives us a little noise, a little variance on the step size, which makes us less likely to get stuck in local minima. And we can even sample the next model from a normal distribution, so that every step size, no matter how far from our current model, has some probability, but the ones very close to our current model are much more likely to be picked. Here, as an example, is what random search looks like when the steps are sampled from a normal distribution. Note that the failures in this case, the steps we've discarded, all have different sizes. A nice property of random search is that it also works if our model space is discrete. For instance, the space of all trees is a discrete space, whereas between any two real-valued vectors there is always another real-valued vector. Between any two trees there is not always another tree. We take discrete steps to get from one tree to another. In such discrete spaces we can also apply random search, we just need to define what it means for two models in our space to be close together. In this picture here, I've drawn a connection between two trees if one can be turned into the other by adding or removing an edge. And in that larger space, we can randomly sample nearby models and apply random search and simulated annealing. Simulated annealing is one way to allow your model to escape local minima. Another thing you can do is simply to run a lot of searches in parallel. Here we see Six searches run in parallel, all ending up in different minima because they start in different points of the model space. And the blue run, as you can see, ends up in the global minimum. This makes a lot of sense for random search, 
for simulated annealing doing multiple runs makes less sense. There's not much difference between 10 runs of 100 iterations or one run of 1000. The only reason you might want to do multiple runs of simulated annealing is because it's easier to parallelize over multiple cores or over multiple machines. Now in this picture, all the parallel runs run entirely independently, unaware of each other. We can actually improve this kind of algorithm by occasionally allowing these parallel runs to communicate with one another. And that leads to what are known as population methods. There are a lot of ways to do this, and most of them are inspired by natural processes. We won't go into this very deeply, but we will look very briefly at the basic principle behind evolutionary algorithms. Like the parallel search, we start with a population of k models who start searching in parallel. We enter a loop. We rank the population of all models by their loss. These are initially randomly chosen. We remove the half with the worst loss. And then we breed a new population of k models by combining aspects of two randomly chosen parents in the previous population. Here's what that looks like. We start with a random population and we measure the loss for all of them. We color the best half green and we color the worst half red. The red part of the population gets killed and removed. In the green part of the population we make k random pairs and create new models by selecting the point halfway between the two models in the pair. And this becomes our new population for which we then again compute all the losses, coloring the top half green and the bottom half red. And we iterate this process. We kill the red models and we breed the green models. Here are five iterations of that algorithm. And note that in the intermediate stage, and note that in the in the intermediate stages, we have a population that covers both the local and the global minima. Population methods are powerful and easy to parallelize, but they can be slow or expensive for complex models especially when these models are large, because we need to maintain in parallel a large collection of these models. And they may be difficult to tune because there are a lot of hyperparameters to set. So zooming out, what have we learned? We've looked at a few simple methods for searching a model space. We've seen that to escape local minima, we can add randomness or look at multiple models in parallel. And we've seen that one trick to converge faster is to let these parallel searches communicate in some way. All of these are instances of what is called black box optimization. Black box optimization refers to those methods that only require us to be able to compute the loss function. We don't need to know anything about the internals of the model so long as we can do that. In the next video, we'll look at a way to improve the search by opening up the black box, looking inside our model, looking at the way it operates, and using that to search the model space more efficiently.